Sean Haverson. Now in our discussion in spinal cord injuries for the paramedic, we're going to be describing shock. Where we've been so far in our lecture, and hopefully you've watched the previous videos, otherwise you can find links to them uh, below and at the end of this video as well. In the videos so far, we have described the anatomy and physiology of the spinal cord as it relates to spinal trauma for EMS. We've described the assessment, both primary and secondary assessment principles and pearls of spinal cord injury, mechanisms of injury that lead to specific types of spinal cord injury, and then we've discussed primary and secondary types of spinal cord injury, including complete and partial transections of the spinal cord. Now we progress into shock in spinal cord injuries. Now, when we use the term shock, we need to be kind of precise about the use of that term. In medicine, right, in all of our EMS learning so far, shock as a term means that we have some reason or some form of hypoperfusion right? We have inadequate blood supply to the cells that need that blood supply to survive. Now, shock as a layman's term is a little bit different. And so we do want to highlight that there are some instances in which shock here may not describe the hypoperfusion. So for our discussion, neurogenic shock and other types of shock like hypovolemic or distributive shock are describing shock proper for medicine, hypoperfusion as a result of the injury. Now, we talked about spinal shock very quickly, I think, with Brown's and Carter syndrome in the previous video, but spinal shock is just to describe a temporary loss of motor and sensory signaling um, at the point of injury, and generally, this temporary phase is 24 hours. So we, in EMS, may not necessarily be able to identify whether it's one or the other because our time frame may be still covered within the spinal shock um, nature of things, but we're probably assessing and managing neurogenic shock uh, as the priority and not spinal shock. This table uh, has a description of some of the parameters compared between spinal shock and neurogenic shock. So we've kind of already described this neurogenic shock is actually going to be shock proper. So hypoperfusion, distributed shock as a result of the sudden loss of sympathetic nerve systems. So we're not communicating with our blood vessels or maybe impacting the function of the heart, depending on where the, brain, where the injury is. Both of these can result in hypotension, though spinal shock would be temporary. The pulse may be bradycardia. And we do have some neurogenic shock that does not result um, in bradycardia. So this could be variable. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Motor function um, is variable, but if it's spinal shock, one of the hallmarks is that they have flaccid paralysis immediately after the injury, but again, temporarily. The time of onset generally can occur within a, a, a variable time frame that expends, extends up to three days after the injury, depending on the factors of the injury and the patient condition. The mechanisms usually in spinal shock are the peripheral neurons are temporarily unresponsive to brain stimuli, but they're not completely cut. When we have neurogenic shock, this is the disruption of autonomic pathways. So we have a loss of sympathetic tone and vasodilation is the result of that loss. And this is likely permanent because the um, cord has been likely cut or partially cut. Could even result of other things like external pressure. Now, in this picture, I like to bring this up. This is actually from our, our human systems textbook in the previous term, uh, or anatomy and physiology des description in the previous term. And we use this to kind of highlight when we're talking about the autonomic nervous system, which is part of our peripheral nervous system and controls our vital signs and essentially all the rest of our body outside of the central nervous system. Um, the divisions of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system anatomy is important for us to understand when we're moving on to neurogenic shock. So let's kind of highlight on this. I'm going to try and zoom in here so we can describe. Uh, excuse me. So what we're showing here is a picture where in the, um, I guess we will call it a bit of an, an orange presentation. In the orange, we have sympathetic nerve fibers, and in green, we have parasympathetic nerve fibers. So a few things to, to kind of recall from anatomy. When we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, we have other names for them as well, right? So some of those names include the parasympathetic nervous system is the cholinergic nervous system, right? It has a layman's term of fight I'm sorry, uh, feed and breed, as opposed to sympathetics, fight or flight. But at this level, we're, we're, we're using uh, higher level terminology. The sympathetic nervous system is called the adrenergic ner nervous system because of its uh, response to adrenaline in the human body. 
So those are two terms. Now, in addition, we can also call the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system by names that associate with where the nerves are branching off the spinal cord and communicating with the body. So from this picture, it's pretty clear that the parasympathetic nerves are branching in the cervical spine and the parasympathetic nerves are branching in the uh, lumbar. Okay, so with the branching of the parasympathetic nervous system happening in the essentially where our uh, cranial nerves are and in the lumbar, we have another term for parasympathetic called the cranial sacral system. Cranial sacral. If you have not memorized that, I would encourage you to do so. In fact, this is really not just the lumbar, but the sacrum as well. So cranial sacral describes the parasympathetic nerve fibers transitioning from high in the neck, the cranial, and very low in our sacrum at the very bottom of a spinal cord. That's where these nerves branch off. And you can see that depending on where the branching is, they communicate with different organs in the body, primarily the uh, portion of the body in the upper uh, uh, Torso, neck, and head are controlled by the cranial portion of the parasympathetic nervous system. The um, abdominal and pelvic organs are controlled by the sacrum uh, division of the nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, you can see, branches between the thorax and the lumbar region of the spine. So a term for sympathetic nervous system opposed to craniosacral is the thoracolumbar. Okay, so remember, sympathetic nervous system is thoracolumbar because it branches, the, the nerves branch off the spinal cord to communicate with our organs at the level of the thorax and lumbar portion of the spine. The cranial sacral is the parasympathetic nervous system where the nerves branching off the spinal cord and brainstem occur in the cranium with our cranial nerves and in the sacrum but not in the thoracolumbar. So this is an important consideration because where the injury is to the spinal cord that results in neurogenic shock is going to dictate some of the vital signs that we have. So for example, if the patient has an injury that is uh, within the thoracolumbar region, say it's an injury that occurs right here, then we would expect that the sympathetic nervous system is probably impacted in this picture, probably the portion of the sympathetic ganglion that's communicating with our lower extreme, our uh, lower abdomen uh, and, and organs inside the abdomen are going to be impacted. Certainly the lower portion, everything below right will be injured. So the lower portion of the parasympathetic nervous system will lose communication, but the parasympathetic nervous system's upper region and some of the sympathetic nervous system's upper region will remain intact, right? This is above the level of injury. So these are still working intact. So if we have a patient presenting particular vital signs uh, and or we can identify where this transaction has occurred, we can then kind of pair with what we expect vital signs to do and or vice versa, based on vital signs, determine where and which part of the nervous system may have been impacted. So this can help explain why some patients in neurogenic shock have bradycardia and others do not. Among, others, uh, among other things. So spend some time, if you haven't before, looking at this, getting a feel for where these divisions and branchings occur. Uh, and from that, we'll be able to piece together some of the vital signs that we get with our neurogenic shock. So when somebody has neurogenic shock, generally what's occurred is at some portion along the spine, the, corn, the spinal cord has been uh, cut and communication um, from below the injury is no longer happening towards the brain and from the brain to the point of injury is no more occurring below that point. So if our blood vessels need to be told to squeeze in our lower extremities, then if the spinal cord has cut a region that is responsible for that control, our blood vessels will then dilate. So as a result of vasodilation, we're going to have blood redistributed. That's why neurogenic shock is distributive shock, right? Distributive shock. The blood doesn't really leave the body if this is an isolated type of shock, but it does get distributed to other regions of the body, which aren't helpful to the, to the heart, um, the brain, the lungs, and our core organs. So generally what occurs is parasympathetic nervous system is dominating. And this is because if the injury occurs within this region, we still will have 
communication with the parasympathetic nervous system because that branching is very high in the cranial nerves and that will still tell the blood vessels and have control to cause them to vasodilate but they will lack if we have an injury that impacts the sympathetic nervous system they will lack control that says to constrict so that opposing balance of homeostasis doesn't occur and we get arterial vasodilation as blood accumulates in the lower extremities we'll have a few different things but in a male the blood accumulating because of this vasodilation in the penis will result in a preopis a preopism is essentially a uh, non-arousal erection, an erection from non-arousal causes, just the blood vessels dilate as they would in arousal and blood rushes to that portion of the body, causing what appears to be a erection, but we would call it a preopism because it is not based on arousal. That can be a sign, uh, in males at least, of a spinal cord injury. Now, when comparing shock, it's really important to remember what our prototypical shock presentation is. So like hypovolemic shock and trauma is by far the most common type of shock that we're going to see. So in hypovolemic shock, I like my little shock triangle, we end up with three vital signs that we like to kind of compare and expect to see their changes when presenting with hypovolemic shock. The patient's ventilatory rate is generally going to be increased. The patient's heart rate should increase to compensate for a normal or low blood pressure. That's typical shock, right? That's what we would expect to see. Why does this occur? Well, it goes back to cardiac output. Cardiac output is essentially blood pressure. And the factors that make up cardiac output include the patient's heart rate times stroke volume. And stroke volume was made up of preload and systemic vascular resistance created by our blood vessels. And we can also call this afterload. Okay, so when the patient's in shock proper, they're, let's say they've got a broken blood vessel, they're bleeding blood outside of their body or out of the blood vessels, and so now their blood volume goes down. So their stroke volume goes down. If stroke volume goes down, the body's compensation, if everything is working normally, is to result in an increasing heart rate. If we increase heart rate, we can make the heart beat faster with the blood it does have in stroke volume to try and increase blood pressure. So heart rate, and the increased ventilatory rate are our body compensating for the loss of blood. Now in neurogenic shock, the, the presentation is a little bit different. So first, we're likely to have at the point of injury, wherever along the spinal cord has been transected, at the point of injury, we're going to have what likely will be a line of demarcation. The line of demarcation is essentially where the communication has stopped below that level of injury with blood vessels. So usually what ends up happening is skin above the injury is going to be cool and clammy. It's going to be cool and clammy, partly because some blood volume is going into the lower extremities where, where vasodilation occurred. But above the level of injury, right, above the level of injury, the sympathetic nervous system is still able to respond. And so it's going to tell the blood vessels above the level of injury to vasoconstrict. That will result in pale, cool, and clammy skin as the body does what it should do, try to preserve the blood that it has. But below the level of injury, the patient has vasodilation. This will result in blood pooling, especially uh, in the extremities, but also dependent on gravity. And as blood pools in those blood vessels and starts to leak out of the blood vessels in the nearby tissue, perhaps causing edema, it's no longer returning back to circulation for a few reasons. Remember that part of our body getting venous blood supply back to the heart is relying on enough pressure going into the veins from the arteries, number one, which we will lose if we have vasodilation. But also the person moving their muscles, even microscopic flexion of the muscles in lower extremities helps push blood back to the heart. And if we have no motor control, not even the microscopic constriction of blood of, of uh, muscles is going to cause blood vessels to get any smaller. So we have multiple factors that allow in this blood pooling. And if the blood is pooling below that level, we can see that as a flushed red skin in appearance. So generally above the level, pale, cool, diaphoretic, like shock you would expect, below the level, flush red skin. And again, because below the level, there's only parasympathetic nervous system communication, not sympathetic nervous system communication. If blood pools in the lower extremities, we decrease stroke volume. And as a result, cardiac output and blood pressure will fall. Now, if the injury has impacted the ability of the sympathetic nervous system to tell the heart rate to increase in result or in response, right, to compensate for the loss in blood pressure, remember cardiac output, heart rate times stroke volume, stroke volume goes down, we would like to see heart rate go up, but that's sympathetic tone. 
if the injury has caused the nervous system to be cut above the point that's communicating with the heart to cause the sympathetic nervous system to increase heart rate in response, if that's cut, the heart rate cannot increase, but parasympathetic response is still working. They become parasympathetic dominant, and as a result, heart rate goes down. So think of that for a moment, right? Think of the, the impact on cardiac output. So again, cardiac, cardiac output, heart rate times stroke volume. If stroke volume is down because of the vasoconstriction, and now the heart rate is down because of parasympathetic dominance, we're going to get a much faster drop in cardiac output and blood pressure, unfortunately. Okay, now let's talk about managing neuro, uh, neurogenic shock. So uh, just a caution that in all management of shock, we have to think of what the cause is in that shock, and then we orient our treatment around addressing that specific cause, right? So this is a, a, a point for us to remind ourselves that shock comes from three different main components. One is a problem with the pump, a problem with the pipes, and a problem with the blood right, the fluid that's in the pipes. So if we're having a patient in most trauma shock, the patient likely has, in again, most trauma cases, has hypovolemia or hemorrhagic shock. In trauma, when we're managing patients with hypovolemic shock, we don't address the patient's blood vessels as our first line of treatment. And this is very important because if the patient's lost a lot of blood, and we cause the blood vessels to squeeze down, but we didn't do anything to replace the blood volume, then we're not going to have a positive result. We're not going to increase the patient's blood pressure or may cause some damage as a result of that. So if they've lost fluid, we want to resuscitate them with fluid. Now, neurogenic shock presents a very, um, I think, isolated, compared to most types of shock, a, a pretty isolated time in trauma that we get to consider the use of vasopressors as a first-line treatment. So when patients have neurogenic shock, that is a problem with the pipes. If we just give fluids, the pipes will still stay too large, vasodilated, and blood will just pool in the lower extremities and never return to the heart. So fluid by itself is not the answer here. When again, in most trauma shock, fluid is the answer and not pressors. So here we want to utilize a combination of some fluid, some drugs, but when utilizing the drugs here, our goal is to increase the effectiveness or the constriction of the pipes so that we, re we can return the blood volume that's still in the body back into circulation and increase perfusion. A very important distinction compared to other types of shock. So please always treat the actual cause in shock. Think to yourself, what type of shock is this? And then treat that underlying cause in trauma that will almost always be volume or fluid resuscitation as our first line management. Um, with medications. So when managing patients with neurogenic shock being kind of this unique type, and again, we'll have to discuss what happens if they have neurogenic shock and hemorrhagic shock in multi-systems trauma. But if it's just neurogenic shock that they're managing, or we're trying to manage in this patient, we have a couple different strategies we can use to result in essentially increased vasoconstriction, right? That would essentially be our goal in the management of this type of shock. So we can utilize vasopressors and we have, at least in the state of New Mexico, our, our scope of practice for the paramedic allows the use of all vasopressors. So the next line in your decision making will probably be what your local service protocol allows you to give. Now, just talking in the medicine sense and just the tools that we have um, across the board, if we have all vasopressors in our scope at the paramedic level, um, I'll talk about the different tools and then you can help make the decisions for your patient based on protocol, patient condition, and this knowledge. So if we're giving patients vasopressors, what vasopressor would you choose and what is the end goal? Well, it kind of depends on a couple components of the patient's presentation. So the first idea, if we're just talking about the typical neurogenic shock is to say that in neurogenic shock, remember cardiac output, made up of heart rate times stroke volume. Neurogenic shock has a decreased stroke volume because of the uh, decrease in systemic vascular resistance and decrease of preload. Blood is pooling in the extremities, pooling in other areas of the body because the blood vessels below the injury got vasodilated with parasympathetic nervous system dominance. But in most neurogenic shock prototypical textbook cases, the heart rate is also decreased because of the lack of sympathetic stimulation depending on where the injury is to the heart, so parasympathetic dominance again. And this has caused a multiple fold decrease in cardiac output. 
So what is our goal in giving the patient drugs to reverse neurogenic shock? Well, the goals will be to increase, increase systemic vascular resistance, right, goals, to increase preload. And again, these two things play into increasing stroke volume. And we may also need to increase heart rate as our goal. So which you choose depends on which of these goals you're trying to manage. So if we force the vessels to constrict, we can return systemic vascular resistance, preload and stroke volume. And if we have something that works on the heart rate, then we can also increase cardiac output that way. Now let's continue and we'll talk more about vasopressors as we go. All right, so in neurogenic shock management, the priorities are going to be that we need to manage patient's life threat during the primary assessment. So we're gonna have C-spine, plus X, uh, X, A, B, C, D, and E in our primary assessment. So don't forget C-spine needs to come early in these mechanisms and we need to manage patients external bleeding if they have that in addition. Rapid transport after identifying this patient and packaging is essential uh, with appropriate spinal considerations and precautions based on their injury. We're gonna have to manage for all patients in shock, their temperature. So increase the temperature in the back of the compartment, cover your patient and make sure that if they're wet or have uh, other things that are making them cold on them to remove them so we can warm them. Now, if patients have multi-systems trauma with neurogenic shock as well, uh, that can lead to potential hypovolemic shock on top of their neurogenic shock, in which we're going to have to make a combination of management decisions to help address this patient. And we're, they are relevant to our discussion in PHTLS. Support ventilation and oxygenation, especially if we have an injury in the cervical spine above the level of C5. They won't be breathing on their own, so we'll have to take over to prevent the respiratory and cardiac arrest. Or they may have varying degrees of inefficient ventilation and oxygenation because of the underlying injury if they don't have an injury to the cervical spine as well. We will initiate IV solution with isotonic crystalloid solution and administer fluids, but we do have targets. So let's put a pin here. We have some targets to manage. And then we'll progress to our second line treatment. But our focus, if it's neurogenic shock, will probably not just be the fluids. All right, continuing to manage uh, central nervous system injuries, we now wanna talk a little bit about some of the algorithms that were brought forth or decision tools brought forth in the um, NAEMT PHCLS 9th edition published in 2020. So this, this comes from the current PHCLS textbook in which there's a diagram, figure 3-20, that highlights the uh, targets of our um, IV fluid resuscitation depending on specific parameters. So when you look at this out of the PHCLS textbook, you'll find that there's a section that describes how to manage uh, controlled external hemorrhage, uncontrolled internal hemorrhage, and then CNS injury is a separate section of that volume resuscitation. So this is to say that if we have a patient that has an isolated central nervous system injury, we're going to titrate our fluid resuscitation to these parameters. And this is different, by the way, if, than somebody who has an internal bleed and hypovolemia or hemorrhagic shock as their primary means or primary goal of our resuscitation. If they have an internal bleed in addition to central nervous system injury, we can't really utilize this set of parameters because it will basically overwhelm our management of an internal bleed and cause further injury. So if we have isolated central nervous system injury, neurogenic shock included, our IV fluid is going to be titrated to maintain a systolic blood pressure of at least 90 millimeters of mercury. Now going way back to our first discussion in traumatic brain injury physiology and related to uh, spinal cord physiology is to remember that the brain and spinal cord use much higher amounts of oxygen and need higher perfusion pressures to meet their minimal needs when they're not injured than other tissues in the body. So whereas if a patient has hypovolemic shock, we may be titrating their systemic, their systolic blood pressure to a range between 80 and 90 to prevent them from bleeding out, or we call that permissive hypotension. In central nervous system injury, that's too low of a target to give good blood flow and oxygenation to the injured central nervous system. So a consideration will be an isolated uh, neurogenic shock, meaning it doesn't have hypovolemic shock also with it, is to manage a much higher titration of blood pressure to get not a systolic blood pressure of 90, but a map of 80 to 90 millimeters of mercury, which may bring us well above the 100 milligrams um, 
uh, millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure that we consider minimum perfusion. So we're going to be titrating to a map of 85 to 90 millimeters of mercury for spinal cord injury, again, assuming they don't also have uh, hypovolemic shock so that we can get perfusion and oxygen to meet the needs of that injured tissue specifically. So consider this. Think about involving this into your decision process when you have a spinal cord injury. All right, so now let's talk about the next step in management. We've already managed their primary assessment. We've started secondary and we're transporting. We've started our IVs during the transport phase and we're targeting our fluid to the right parameters. As a reminder, if hypovolemic shock is not present, then we can go for our parameter of a map of 85 to 90. If hypovolemic shock is present, we have to defer to permissive hypotension. We'll have lower targets for our fluid, although we're kind of giving that at the expense of spinal cord perfusion, we don't want to cause their internal bleeding that's also with their spinal cord injury to get worse. So something to remember, if you need more information on this, see our shock management video. Or you can also look at the diagram of the PHCLS 9th edition. The diagram that I described on the previous slide has in it on the same page the diagram for uh, permissive hypotension. So what are our goals? After we've got IV access, now we can start thinking about increasing cardiac output um, by increasing increased systemic vascular resistance and increasing preload. All those things should increase our patient's blood pressure. So we have a few options to be able to do this. So what's happening is our blood vessels are dilated when the body should be constricting them, right? So we want to cause this. Now that's the major problem. Major problem is that the blood vessels have vasodilated, blood is pooling in the lower extremities, and the blood pressure and cardiac output are going down because the blood is stuck there and not returning to the heart to increase blood pressure. So if we wanted to manage the vasoconstriction, we cause vasoconstriction, manage that wide open set of blood vessels that the disease caused, we can start looking for alpha-1 adrenergic receptor site activation. So drugs that stimulate alpha-1 activation will result in vasoconstriction, which will cause an increased systemic vascular resistance. That's one set of drugs and parameters. Now, if the patient also has bradycardia, this is depending on where their injury is, where they've lost communication with their heart through the sympathetic nervous system, so their heart rate is low because the parasympathetic nervous system's not impacted and dominant, then we have to also consider beta-1 activation. And with beta-1 activation, beta-1 adrenergic receptor sites associated with the heart, beta-1 activation increases chronotropic effect, so that would increase heart rate, increasing inotropic or fo force of contraction, increasing automaticity, and essentially force the heart to work harder. And that's where we'll get both parts of our cardiac output equation managed if we have both beta-1 and alpha-1. In the cases where patients don't have bradycardia, if they have tachycardia, which would be your expectation for someone who's in shock as the body compensates, then we may only focus on alpha-1 activation. There are a lot of drugs that can be useful in managing patients, and it can kind of get a little bit complex um, when we're trying to make some of the decisions between these. But we'll try to keep it simple here, knowing that uh, the, the decision will probably be partly from your protocols. All right, so as a reminder, these are some of the receptor sites that are associated with the sympathetic nervous system. Alpha-1 adrenergic receptor sites are located in the vascular wall and some degree in the heart. Their major effect is vasoconstriction of blood vessels, peripheral vasoconstriction, which is exactly what we need, right? This is one of the things we want to get. Beta adrenergic receptor sites are broken into beta-1 and beta-2. Beta-1 is associated with the heart. We have one heart, help you memorize that. Beta-2 is associated with the lungs and to some degree, blood vessels as well. Dopaminergic receptor sites uh, through a secondary process are responsible for dose-dependent dopamine. Uh, dopaminergic receptor sites are responsible for in low doses are renal vasodilation. And then in higher doses, we can get vasoconstriction and some beta-1. So that's to say dopaminergic can result in beta-1 effects and some alpha-1 effects, right? So um, primarily that drug would be through dopamine. In this diagram, you can see uh, a number of vasoactive medications. Many of them are within the common scope of practice for paramedics in the field, again, depending on what your service decides to carry and put in your protocols. But this gives you in one place an area where you can see the effects of all of these drugs on those receptor sites. So we've got alpha-1, which would be vasoconstriction, beta-1, which would be the heart, beta-2, which would be lungs and a little bit of vasoconstriction, and dopaminergic 
which we'll see will give us some alpha and beta effects as well. So let's start going through the lines. So neosinephrine or phenylephrine, though not necessarily commonly used as an IV medication in the pre-hospital setting, could be in some protocols, is primarily going to give us alpha-1. So that would be a great drug to cause vasoconstriction in the periphery and give us an increase in cardiac output through this means. Norepinephrine is a very strong alpha-1 uh, drug. It's mostly selective for alpha-1 adrenergic receptor sites and gives us a small effect of beta-1. So we can get some heart rate effect out of it, but I wouldn't rely on it. By and large, most of the effects of the dose ranges we give norepinephrine in will be alpha-1. So again, this is a great drug choice in many protocols that allows us to reverse um, that vasodilation that's occurred. Epinephrine can also be helpful. It's non-selective as an adrenergic agonist, so it has alpha-1 effect, beta-1, and a little bit of beta-2 effect as well. So here, epinephrine can address both the uh, blood vessel side of things through alpha-1, but can also impact heart rate force of contraction um, if the patient is bradycardic as a drug. So epinephrine, also another drug that would be useful and in our scope of practice. Dopamine can be useful depending on the, the range. So when we're in the low dose range, we're primarily not doing a whole lot for systemic um, vascular resistance. We're not doing much for the heart. We're primarily in the renal range. So we don't use, utilize this in the pre-hospital setting. Instead, we're gonna be utilizing the mid and high range so that we can get the varying effects of alpha and beta. So generally, through the dopaminergic response of dopamine, we will get beta effects for beta-1, so heart rate force of contraction as an inotrope, a very good drug. And at high doses, we'll also start to recruit alpha-1 receptor sites and get vasoconstriction on top of the function of the heart. So dopamine can get, give us a few different um, angles in one drug to manage this uh, by a secondary means. Now, dobutamine and isoproteranol would not necessarily be helpful here because, as you can see, they lack effect in alpha-1. So these drugs would mainly target our beta-1 effect, the effect of the heart, and not cause blood vessels to vasoconstrict. So they're generally not considered good drug choices. Great, and restated on this slide, we can kind of see that broken down in a less visual way. So phenylephrine's pure alpha effects will not really do much for heart rate. And unfortunately, phenylephrine as a result can cause a reflex bradycardic response that would actually essentially make their cardiac output and heart rate go down further. So again, most services are likely not carrying phenylephrine IV. It's usually in um, liquid nasal spray formula to facilitate our intubations. Norepinephrine's powerful alpha effects can be very helpful, but it doesn't have a large impact on beta-1, some but not large. So primarily, we're going to be increasing systemic vascular resistance and preload to increase cardiac output. So this makes norepinephrine a great choice. Now, in the past, we didn't necessarily learn about norepinephrine in the same way in paramedic school. So those that went to paramedic school a few years ago and before probably learned that norepinephrine was a very last line choice in the management of any patient's shock. Norepinephrine generally, though, is now thought of as a better choice and certainly can be utilized. I wouldn't consider this as being a last line of defense in the management of patients with neurogenic shock. It does a lot of the good things that we want to get out of this medication. Um, it's going to address in our patients with neurogenic shock. So very good at alpha-1 in a small amount of beta-1, especially if I have a patient that has neurogenic shock without bradycardia. This might be a good choice. So great choice if I'm without bradycardia. I'll probably have tachycardia, and I don't want a drug that will increase their cardiac workload too much because then I'll get a, um, a rate-dependent decrease in blood pressure. Epinephrine might also be helpful because it's going to have a powerful alpha-1, like norepinephrine, powerful beta-1, which norepinephrine lacks, and then some beta-2 effects, which can help blood vessels a little bit. Epinephrine, also a wise choice in the management of these patients. Now, I don't want to leave out dopamine, but over the years, dopamine has become less of a favorable drug, favorable drug because of the variable response that it has. And we have some better choices now that we have epinephrine and norepinephrine drips in the pre-hospital setting. But let me include Dopamine might be a good choice, but please don't confuse this with dobutamine, which would do absolutely nothing to manage our patient's blood vessels. So again, you have a few decisions, uh, choices you can make uh, dependent on whether or not there's the presence of bradycardia uh, with our hypotension or just the hypotension as a result of systemic vascular, peripheral vascular dilation. So norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine seem to be our primary choices in the field.
And now you know why. Let's talk a little bit though about managing patients with, with uh, spinal cord injuries in spinal immobilization. And this is a difficult area to discuss because spinal immobilization in the pre-hospital setting is rapidly undergoing some changes that are uh, teaching and testing, at least for the initial training of paramedics, is not necessarily caught up with. So a note that regardless of your local protocol, when you're taking this course to manage patients in the school setting, like you're a paramedic in paramedic training, you do want to consider the parameters of testing and training um, uh, separate from the parameters of what's going on in the field because it takes a while for some things to catch up with changes that our local services meet. As a reminder, also never treat patients on national registry or in your training program at your school according to local protocol because the national registry exam is not written to local protocol, uh, nor is most of the national level education that makes up our textbooks and curriculum in most classes. Now, uh, if you're taking this course as par part of my paramedic, course at CNM, I've also supplied for you some uh, reading from some journal articles that describe why we're changing the way that we go through spinal mobilization and how to make, based on evidence-based science, the right decision. Here, I'll have to highlight that, but those resources are available on my website, um, uh, chiefsays.com, and also you can find most of them uh, free searches on Google as well. So to board a patient, to backboard a patient or not to backboard the patient is the essential question. So again, we're kind of in a state of flux with active uh, research going on to make some of these determinations, but it is known and has been known for quite some time that the use of backboards can be harmful to, for patients. Right? Some of the things that uh, can result from long-term backboards, and this can occur from, uh, don't quote me exactly on this number, but I want to say in patients um, that are on backboards for as little as 10 to 20 minutes, can suffer some uh, long-term and some devastating impacts if some of the effects go on for too long, especially the result of decubitus ulceration. If a backboard is not padded and a patient, especially an older patient, is placed on a backboard strapped down, they're going to be in one position up against that board with their tissue pressed against it for long periods of time. And it doesn't take long for bed sores, which decubitus ulceration uh, essentially are, doesn't take a long time for bed sores to occur. So if you have patients on the backboard for long periods of time, we have to be very aware of this and utilize padding if we're backboarding. Also, when we arrive at the hospital, the hospital should be aware of this as well, and they should seek to get the patient x-rayed and off the board as quick as possible to decrease the effects of those ongoing decubitus ulcers, especially in patients um, that are elderly. The positional um, restrictions of the patient can also cause some uh, impact to uh, blood flow circulation, especially if backboarding is done improperly. So when spinal motor restriction is unnecessary. So it's generally going to be a process that your local protocol may or may not allow you to do along the lines of clearing somebody's C-spine. So this is when you uh, essentially utilize your protocols to fit the patient condition and the context of that patient's injury to determine whether or not you should backboard them or they could do well without the backboard. So when we generally are outlining that spinal motor restriction is unnecessary, it would mean they have all of these things going for them. Patients have a GCS of 15, alert, able to process information, and you can rely on the information they're giving you when you assess them and ask them questions. No spine tenderness or anatomic abnormality plus GCS. No distracting injuries. And again, a distracting injury is when a patient has excuse me, an injury that is visually or physically painfully more powerful than the underlying other potentially worse injuries that they have. For example, a patient that has a fractured arm and has lost sensation to their lower extremities may note that they've lost sensation to the lower extremities, but that pain is probably getting their attention more than anything else. So a distracting injury may make it harder for them to sense based on your assessment of them whether or not they have the positive signs and symptoms you're looking for to screen for spinal motor restrictions. So if they have a distracting injury and these other things, they would not qualify for spinal motor restriction um, uh, being cleared. They can't be intoxicated, and this goes to essentially their GCS. They, If they're intoxicated, we can't necessarily rely on the information they're giving us, so we may um, inadvertently act on bad information when they do actually have the signs and symptoms that would require spinal motor restrictions. And then finally, in addition to all of these things, they have no neurological findings that are abnormal or complaints. If those things are present, you may, based on your protocol, be able to clear the patient and not backboard them uh, for their management.
Indications for spinal motor restriction can include some of these things or any one of these things essentially in the presence of a suspected spinal uh, cord injury or mechanism that can lead to spinal cord injury would mean we probably need to give them spinal motor restrictions and backboard them. So those will include things like blunt force trauma and MOI suggesting the potential for injury, remembering that blunt force trauma can move the spine or cause enough injury towards the spine uh, to cause a uh, spinal cord injury. Midline spinal pain or tenderness would be an indication that they need spinal motor restrictions. Again, partially kind of at the testing and academic level. Again, your local protocol may be different on this, but we're talking about this for initial paramedic training. If they have altered LOC or intoxication or distracting injuries, if they have paralysis or focal neurologic signs and symptoms, meaning you can pinpoint them, distracting injuries, anatomical deformity of the spine, or just an inability to communicate. So if they speak a different language, we're not going to, to rely on the information they give us or the information they receive from us because they can't understand in their language. And so we can't rely on our assessment. We'll have to default towards, I'm not sure, so I probably have to backboard them. Now, clearing C-spine is a term that I use because it's been used in the field for years, although it was uh, not necessarily a, a great um, legal term. It is primarily old terminology now as in the ninth edition of PHTLS. So per the PHTLS's ninth edition, we get this reading. Primary focus of pre-hospital care is to recognize the indications for spinal motor restriction rather than to attempt to clear the C-spine. So this, this means that we should not be focusing to clear the C-spine because that would give us some form of confirmation bias or anchoring bias in which we might miss the other signs that say we should backboard this patient. So identify candidates and use appropriately. Spinal precautions kind of vary in our approach at, at very uh, varying degrees of local protocols. So again, if we're talking about spinal precautions or spinal motor restriction for registry or for the purposes of running scenarios in school, it probably means that you're likely going to give full spinal immobilization unless there's a reason not to. So if you're holding C-spine and you think they have a, a spinal injury, you're probably doing the full set of backboarding to whatever variation that you need to. Is that rapid extraction with the seat collar onto a board and onto a gurney with straps on the gurney, then to the truck and full backboarding? Are we fully backboarding here because we've got to carry them a long distance? Lots of differences in that. In the field, there's lots of differences based on local, local protocol. Some local protocol may allow the patient to be placed on a stretcher, not a board with, with rigid seat collar uh, or some other variation of, of not full immobilization. So in some protocols, those considerations might be for patients that are ambulating when you arrive, they're walking around, although that doesn't always mean they don't have a spinal cord injury. In fact, I've been on a call where a patient was literally walking around with their hands on the bottom of their head, and it looked like they were trying to hold their head off of their neck. And so we backboarded that patient standing up after a car accident. Again, they were walking around when we got there, but they had this sign that they were holding their head up. And when we took them to the patient to the hospital, the patient did have a cervical spine injury and was uh, uh, at a point where if they had let go of their neck because they had an unstable C-spine, they probably would have caused damage to their, their uh, spinal cord. So don't use the fact that they're walking around by itself as a means that you don't have to backboard. Certainly they can have injuries and still be walking around. Patient reliable patients, meaning you rely on their history, they're not intoxicated, they don't have distracting injury, um, but they have mild to moderate neck pain, but no deficit or no back pain. Or patients backboard, uh, backboarding the patient is warranted, but there's a distracting, not warranted, but there's a distracting circumstance, distracting injury, intoxication, and so on. When spinal motor restriction is absolutely required or when spinal motor restriction is indicated, we need to make sure we do the job correctly. So this means not letting go of the head once you hold C-spine until the patient is packaged. And remember, hey, people are recording our care now on scenes with their telephones. And if that, that recording makes its way to court and shows that you let go of the patient's head so you can do something else along the patient care, and as a result, they have some spinal cord trauma, it'll be very difficult for you to argue that your actions did not cause their situation to get worse because the video will show the lack of our confidence. So make sure that you understand your equipment, you understand the procedures on your local protocol, or if you're in school, the procedures in your, your lab class, um, and do so rigorously. Like if we have to do this, it's to prevent quadriparaplegia, it's to prevent them from severing their spinal cord, it's to prevent them from maybe stopping breathing and going into rest to arrest if the injury is high enough. So there's a lot on the line if we get this wrong.
Neutral inline positioning is contraindicated in patients when there's resistance to movement, meaning I try to put their head into inline positioning when I first hold C-spine, but I, I, when I try to move their head from the position I find it, there's pain or physical resistance when I try to move their head. In that case, we leave the head where it's at and we don't move it in line and we continue with restricting that, their motion otherwise. Neck muscle spasms may preclude our ability to move it, probably gives us physical resistance, increasing in pain when I try to move their head into inline, Worsening neurologic deficit when I do so, meaning perhaps I did CMS before I moved the head and then I moved the head and found that in moving the head, I lost some of my CMS assessment, or if moving the head will cause airway or ventilatory compromise. In that case, we don't not immobilize, but we're going to have to mobilize their head with padding and other means in a way that a C collar and head block may not fit. So we have to get crafty in, in immobilizing uh, or splinting the head. When applying the uh, device, we do want to be conscious of some of the things that can go wrong with this. So make sure that we've got padding throughout the device. So generally some padding on the whole device before the patient's laid onto the backboard will be helpful, but also pad in areas like in the adult padding behind the head will help keep their spine in line and make sure their airway is in the proper position. But in pediatrics, because their head is going to be so large compared to their shoulders, we may need to apply shoulder padding to keep their head and airway in line. And then again, to prevent things like decubitus ulcers or um, bed sores from occurring, we want to make sure that we've got some compression and some uh, padding between bony prominences in the device. So if you can pad the whole device, that will address this. And then also, in addition to padding the device, pad in the voids between the spine and between legs before we start strapping them down so that we're not abnormally um, pressuring our extremities uh, or their body into abnormal positions. There is certainly a place for rapid extrication. Uh, it is true that sometimes when we get on scene, backboarding would keep us on scene too long in critical patients if we did the full backboarding as you learned at the MT basic level. So instead, we do have a procedure which allows us to still maintain spinal motor restrictions, but we can get off scene much more quickly than if we had to fully immobilize as we learned in the you know, early stages of our EMT basic training. So that looks like when we take the patient and we hold manual C-spine precautions, someone's holding the head and making sure the head and neck don't move and communicating with the patient. Again, do that before you talk to patients or tell patients not to move their head until you start holding their head as you approach them because our natural tendency is to look up at people when they're talking to us. And if that's the case and they have a cervical spine injury, which we haven't been able to assess yet since we just walked up to the patient, we want to preclude them from making that worse. So hold their head before talking to them or at least tell them not to move their head until you arrive. Now, when we're doing this, we're going to hold manual stabilization of the spine. We palpate the back as appropriate in our rapid assessment, and we may place a seat collar on the patient, but we're probably not going through the head block and straps. Once the patient, we still have manual head stabilization and seat collar, we can rapidly, carefully log roll the patient, put them onto a board, manually hold C-spine and move the board over to a gurney and then utilize the gurney straps to strap the patient onto the board and the gurney at the same time without strapping them to the board first. Now in doing this, we're not securing the torso so we cannot secure the head. Remember that rule, the torso has to be secured before the head. So you're, the person that's holding manual C-spine is gonna continue holding manual C-spine as we walk with the gurney and as we load into the back of the truck. Once we're in the back of the truck, now we can take the time during transport, hopefully with extra hands, to fully immobilize the patient to the backboard as our protocol requires, but we're at least traveling off scene and getting closer towards their definitive care rather than staying on scene to take the time to fully immobilize them. But again, remember, you can't let go to the head and we can't strap the head down until the torso is fully strapped so someone's still got their hands on the head as this procedure unfolds. Complications of spinal cord injuries do occur. Now, some of these complications like autonomic dysreflexia may also have the term autonomic hyperreflexia. These are complications that don't necessarily occur in the immediate moments after their spinal cord injury. In fact, autonomic dysreflexia usually occurs in later phases of injury when the patient may be at a hospital receiving care, 
we're with our patient in interfacility inter transports or they're at home receiving care uh, after they've been discharged um, for their long-term spinal cord injury care. So what ends up happening in a particular set of circumstances when a patient has an existing spinal cord injury and the injury is in the range or above T4 to T6 is this abnormal response of the autonomic or sympathetic nervous system. So when this occurs, it can be life-threatening in its presentation and again, usually happens after they've already had a spinal cord injury and likely already undergoing some type of treatment. Patients, when they have uh, the autonomic hyperreflexia, the response is a massive, uncompensated cardiovascular response. So think sympathetic dominance. The parasympathetic nervous system is not compensating, is not uh, uh, counteracting the effects um, of this response. So they're going to have a massive response of cardiovascular proportions, which can cause uh, life-threatening injury. Now, what happens though for this to occur is that again, the patient likely has an underlying spinal cord injury and in the phases after their injury, they may develop something like a skin lesion. So bed sores, decubitus ulcers can occur. Again, if they have a spinal cord injury, they're probably not very mobile. They may be restricted to a wheelchair or to a bed, depending on the degree of their uh, quad or paraplegia. And because of that, they're not moving around. And so they get pressure sores, just as anyone who would be in bed would do so. It could also be from things that have uh, constricting clothing. Again, they can't feel the constriction if it's in an area where they've lost sensation or sharp objects are compressing the skin. But a more common cause that we see in the inner facility setting uh, than these, although these can happen, is when there's a lot of bladder pressure because the urine catheter is blocked or full and back pressure from the, the Foley bag is going back into the urine and making the bladder larger. So the bladder pressure or any of these things causes stimulation to go to the patient's um, uh, body, but they're probably not aware of it, again, because it's likely below the level of injury. So they're not physically sensing that these things are occurring. So they go on for longer than they should, to be honest with you. When this occurs, the body gets that stimulus through the nervous system that there are these things occurring, although the brain doesn't necessarily perceive it. And as a result, they get a sympathetic response. So autonomic dysreflexia. So this is going to come with massive sympathetic response to cardiac output, blood pressure, heart rate, and so on. When we're managing patients that have spinal cord injuries, there are other drugs that we have to consider outside of the use of vasopressors for that emergent use. And some of these will be drugs that may be utilized in the long-term care of a patient. Something to consider is that patients with spinal cord injuries, they may have long, long roads ahead of them with lots of care impacting their family and impacting the economy. The average cost to care for a patient with a spinal cord injury for the lifetime after their injury is $1.2 million worth of medical care. So there's a long road ahead of them to say the least in these patients' uh, lives. Now, when we're managing patients on scene, we may have to use things to reduce their uh, agitation. We may need to manage patients and sedate them. So short acting reversible sedatives are commonly recommended for acute agitation. Why would we want to sedate someone who's got acute agitation with spinal cord injury? Well, if we don't want them to move because we don't want that movement to cause worsening spinal cord injuries, then someone who's fighting us while we're trying to backboard them or fighting us on the backboard or whatever means of uh, motor restriction we have to care for them may inadvertently cause their injury to be worsened. So sedation may be necessary, but use something that's short acting and reversible if necessary. In some cases, patients may not have complete numbness. There may be degrees of pain that they're receiving, degrees of pain signals that they're receiving. So pain medications may be necessary, and this will be partially dependent on their hemodynamic stability. Use caution in, in medications that will cause hypotension to avoid that secondary injury. So just like we had in traumatic brain injuries, secondary injuries commonly come from situations in which we have hypotension, uh, hy hypoxia, hypo or hypercarbia, um, changes to blood sugar, all those things will make the tissue swell more, uh, experience more damage, or prevent the tissue from managing with the emergent phase of the tissue's response to the injury. So we want to make sure that whatever we're doing does not cause a secondary injury, often through hypotension or hypoxia when giving these medications. So use caution when giving sedatives and pain medications. Corticosteroids are generally not used in spinal cord injury treatment, especially in the acute phase or the early phase of injury. But when patients have uh, injuries to their spinal cord that 
are of lower degrees or lower level, or in their long-term treatment, the physician may decide to reduce some of the swelling with some type of steroid management, although this would be outside of our scope. Another consideration in special populations is to describe patients that have a spinal cord injury but are also pregnant. Now, this is going to be similar to just any advice you would have in managing a pregnant patient that we have to use spinal motor restrictions in, because in managing the patient's spinal motor restrictions, we're probably placing them into a supine position. And pregnant patients that are in the second and third trimester, if they're in the supine position, they'll experience a condition of supine hypotension syndrome. Supine hypotension describes when the patient that is pregnant in second, third trimester lays on their back and the size and weight of the baby in the uterus sits down and restricts blood flow returning through the vena cava to the heart. And as a result, if the vena cava is restricted, that will result in restricting preload and reducing cardiac output. So when we manage patients that are uh, suffering a spinal cord injury while they're pregnant, especially in second and third trimester, will immobilize them as described by your local protocol. But once they're immobilized, we need to tilt the device and the patient towards the left side of that patient. So they'll be sitting on the gurney tilted towards you when they're in the back of the ambulance um, with a lot of padding underneath that side and then sec secure the board to the padding and the gurney. So that might look like your patient's head on the board here. Here's our gurney. You put a bunch of padding or pillows, and then we apply the straps of the gurney over the strapped board uh, with that tilt. So again, this will help, but also if the patient um, is in second or third trimester, when you place the tilt of the board or the padding to tilt the board, you can also help the patient and use them. They'll, they'll know a little bit more about their body than we do externally, but encourage them and help them shift the baby and uterus a little bit towards the left so it rolls off of not just tilting them but helping it roll off of the vena cava in that tilted position and certainly it's not very difficult as you coach the patient to do this all right so that concludes our review of spinal cord injuries this is a little bit longer section of the video but covers all of the important points that we need for our discussion at the paramedic level. If you have any questions, please reach out to me, uh, leave some comments below, and the next set of videos will continue on in our uh, exploration of specific traumatic injuries. I believe our next two lectures will be thoracic trauma and abdominal trauma. All right, stay safe out there, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Peace.